Jean Tunney's first win over Jack Dempsey. With more on that fight, here's an excerpt from Sports Century. When Dempsey fought Tunney in 1926, his best years were behind him. Three years since he fought Firpo, and he was an old fighter. Tunney was at his peak. He studied Dempsey's style very, very closely and developed his own style in a way that would uh, combat that successfully. Dad was depicted as being a sissy poo because he liked to read. They thought, if anything, he was kind of a skinny, ungainly person that wouldn't have stood a chance against the great dynamite of Jack Dempsey. It was so one-sided. It was all Tunney in the rain, 10 rounds of just picking Dempsey apart. Dempsey looks tired. Tunney is unmarked. Tunney gives Dempsey a shaking up with a left jab. And Tunney toyed with him. When the fight was over, Dempsey's eyes were slit shut like Mr. Magoo. He tells one of his aides, take me over there. I've got to congratulate him, but I can't see him. Dempsey was finished. Tunney was the new heavyweight champion. It was like Paul Bunyan had been defeated. Later in Al Bernstein's continuing series, Bernstein Unboxing, he'll tell us which style he prefers, the puncher or the boxer. But now stay tuned for Classic Boxing's Greatest Champions, the heavyweight stylist, hosted by Kurt Gowdy. Everybody, Kurt Gowdy, welcome to show two of Boxing's Greatest Champions. Show one, we took a look at the big punchers of the heavyweight division. In this show, we're going to study the stylists, the so-called boxers of the heavyweight champs. Then we're going to be moving on to the welterweight, lightweight division and show three, middleweight division, show four, light heavyweight, show five. Our last show, show six, the Boxing Writers Association of America, the top writers, experts, will pick their choice of the top fighters of each category, and uh, we want you to match right along with us. Now, my guest today is Ted Brenner, who is the president of boxing of Madison Square Garden. Ted Brenner has promoted more championship fights than anyone in the history of boxing. You always think of Tex Rickard, Mike Jacobs, great promoters. Ted Brenner has promoted more championship fights than Rickard and Jacobs together. And Teddy, welcome to Boxing's Greatest Champions. Thank you for having me here. All right. Our category today is heavyweight division number two, the boxers, the stylists. And the first man we're going to study, I think uh, you signed him for his first championship fight, didn't you? Floyd Patterson? Floyd Patterson. Well, it wasn't his first championship fight, but I gave him his first fight, his first 13 fights. First 13. His first loss, which he suffered to Joey Maxim on a bad decision. Uh, he was the youngest man to ever win the heavyweight title. And he was the first man to regain the heavyweight championship after losing it. Now let's study Floyd Patterson. one of your very early Golden Globe fights in 1951 with John Gibson. Yes, I remember this one. In fact, I lunged into the air, as you see, and I kept lunging, and he dumped. As I did so, I, 
I rolled over and stood on my head. I didn't know that I was standing on my head until I seen the papers the next day. They took a picture of me standing directly on my head. That's not the only thing I remember in this one. November 30th, 1956. Number one heavyweight contender Floyd Patterson takes on world light heavyweight champion Archie Moore for the heavyweight title vacated on the retirement of Rocky Marciano. Patterson in white trunks. Archie Moore is wearing dark trunks. In rounds one through four, Patterson's lightning quick jab enables him to take a slim lead in the scoring. Here in round five, it's still anybody's fight. Unbelievably, Archie Moore at 43 is giving away 22 years to the younger Floyd Patterson. One year ago, Archie Moore was KO'd by Rocky Marciano in his first attempt to win the World Heavyweight Championship. Before Archie won the World Light Heavyweight Championship four years ago, Moore was regarded in boxing circles as the uncrowned Light Heavyweight Champion. This is Archie Moore's 12th fight this year. He has won all 11 of his previous fights this year, eight by knockout. Since turning professional in 1952, four years ago, Floyd Patterson has had 31 fights, losing only one. That won a controversial eight-round decision to former light heavyweight champion of the world, Joey Maxim. Patterson slips to the canvas. The referee wipes his gloves and signals the fighters to continue. Canvas. The referee moves in to pick up the count. Moore definitely in trouble here in round five. Archie gets up at the count of nine, and Patterson moves in to finish him. A lightning combination, and the light heavyweight champion hits the canvas again. The referee screaming out the count. Archie Moore struggling to get to his feet. It's all over. Floyd Patterson scores a fifth-round knockout victory over Archie Moore to win the vacated World Heavyweight Championship. June 1960, Yankee Stadium, New York. Challenger Floyd Patterson takes on heavyweight champion Ingemar Johansson. Patterson goes to work early, working with sharp hooks to the body and the head. Johansson trying to measure his man with his lethal right hand. But Patterson constantly moves to his right, away from Johansson's payoff punch. Now it's Patterson with a sharp left hook, and Johansson is down. He's hurt. Referee Artie McCanty picks up the count. The champion, Johansson, here in round five, tries to clear the cobwebs, but Patterson won't be denied. He remembers that Johansson knocked him out in three rounds in June of 1959. He wants to make history tonight. Patterson throws caution to the wind and pummels the big sweep with lefts and rights to the body and head, and then back to the body. Johansson is always dangerous, but is plainly hurt. He tries to hold on. Patterson is trying to coordinate his attack, waiting for the big opening. Patterson fakes to the body and lets go with a tremendous left hook. And if you look closely, Johansson's right foot quivers from the force of the blow. Referee Mercanti counts to ten, and out. Now in slow motion, you will see just how devastating Patterson's left hook really was. A big knockout for Floyd Patterson over Ingemar Johansson, as he becomes the first man to regain the heavyweight championship of the world. Irresistibly mellow new cheese radio. Yeah. One of the most formidable fighting machines in boxing history. A man who was to stand overwhelmingly supreme above the other fighters of his era. Jack Johnson. The fight is already a foregone conclusion. In a devastating flurry, Jack Johnson shows that he can handle champion Tommy Burns like a small child. Burns is tied up, his attempts at uppercuts completely nullified. Johnson has a big grin on his face as he continues to chat in the clinches. 
Is you having fun, Mr. Tommy? As the bell rings, Jack gives a friendly little wave to Burns. See you later, Mr. Tommy. Fourteenth round. Renowned sports writer Damon Runyon, who had come 12,000 miles to report the contest, was to write, not one second of any round could legitimately be scored for Burns. Finally, Johnson decides to put an end to the lopsided contest. He advances on the smaller man, and then suddenly, tiger-like, he attacks. Punches rain on the champion. Burns reels around the ring, helpless. At this very moment, the police stepped in and shut off the cameras. Seconds later, they stopped the fight. Jack Johnson was awarded the world's heavyweight championship on the spot. The partisan fight fans have been shouting to Ketchell to flatten the grinning Johnson. Jack has other ideas as he scores the first knockdown. But Ketchell is a champion too, and he rises to continue. It's been Johnson all the way, but the dogged middleweight has a surprise waiting for the overconfident heavyweight champion. Ketchell gets in with one of his renowned right hands. Johnson goes down, surprised to find himself put on the canvas by this little man. He's up at eight and attacks ferociously. Now Stanley drops like a stone. Johnson trips, but he rises quickly. The flabbergasted crowd watches the gallant middleweight counted out, lying flat on his back. Jack Johnson had Ketchell down and out only four seconds after he himself had been on the canvas. ESPN Classic celebrates for Santa $24.99 to the address on your screen. Heavyweight contender, fireman Jim Flynn, seen seated second from the right. Johnson agreed to let the promoters advertise the bout as a fight to the finish. Thus, the Johnson-Flynn fight is the last unlimited length contest in boxing history. The fight, held in Las Vegas, Nevada, 4th of July, 1912, turned out to be one of the most wildly comic mismatches ever seen. This is the first round. The photographer has trouble keeping the fighters' heads in the picture. The motion picture camera still did not have a reliable viewing system. Aiming the lens was done almost by instinct. But we see Johnson demonstrate his Morse code prowess by landing a rat-a-tat-tat on Flynn's nose. It looks as though Flynn didn't get the message as he bores in again. The fifth round. Fireman Jim seems so confused by what looks like an impenetrable defense, Jack Johnson now simply holds him off with his left and belts him at will with his right. After taking a couple of extra hard Johnson uppercuts, Flynn jumps up and down trying to butt with his head. The referee warns Fireman Jim, who listens carefully. Then Jim returns to the fray. In the ninth round, Fireman Jim is at it again. Hop goes this particularly hard-headed jackrabbit. The referee again warns Flynn, but gets an argument. Suddenly, a fourth figure enters the ring. It's the Sheriff of Las Vegas. He stops the bout, awarding Johnson a ninth-round decision. Classic. The age-old question in boxing has been, who is better, the boxer or the puncher? Is it the boxer who wins by using speed, grace, and skills, or is it the puncher who can devastate and win with a single blow? In his continuing series, Bernstein Unboxing, ESPN Classics' Al Bernstein dissects the differences. Over the years, I've had many boxing fans suggest to me that I seem to like either pure boxers or aggressive sluggers more 
based upon my call of certain fights. The truth is that after 20 years of announcing fights and nearly 40 years of watching them, I like them both. But I'm most enamored with those rare fighters who can somehow win fights using both styles, sometimes within the same match. No one embodies that more than the only perfect fighter who ever lived, Sugar Ray Robinson. He could outbox an opponent or destroy him with his power, depending on which suited his purpose. And the proof is that boxers like Muhammad Ali and punchers like Mike Tyson hail Ray as the man they studied and learned from. Now, Aaron Pryor also showed the ability to do both. He was thought by some to be an undisciplined attacker in 1982 when he met powerful but stationary Alexis Arguello for the first time. Instead, Pryor would use lateral movement and hand speed to win the tactical battle before turn power to win by knockout. The great trio of the 1970s and 80s, Sugar Ray Leonard, Marvin Hagler, and Tommy Hearn, could also do it all. They were each sometimes thought of as big punchers and at other times showed boxing skills and guile in the ring. Today's boxing world has two who share those gifts, Shane Mosley and Floyd Mayweather Jr. So there's plenty to love about fancy boxers and lots to admire about aggressive sluggers. But when you get it all in one package, then it reminds you why the sport of boxing can be so entrancing. For ESPN Classic, I'm Al Bernstein. Probably the best example of the boxer beating the puncher was when Muhammad Ali used his ring savvy and the rope a to beat George Foreman. Let's return to Classic Boxing's greatest champions, the heavyweight stylists on ESPN Classic. Jersey Joe Walcott, in white, is slightly behind on points, but Joe is always dangerous. A crisp left hook by Charles, and Walcott is down. Joe will take the full count of nine. Slow motion from the ringside camera shows that damaging left hook by Ezra. Jersey Joe will get up and finish the full 15 rounds, but Ezard Charles goes on to gain a unanimous decision and retains the world heavyweight title. Ezard, when do you think you really have to fight one? After the bell had rung and the, and the judges had announced a decision in my favor? <laughs> <laughs> Was Walcott pretty tough at all times? Yeah, yeah, he seemed to be pretty tough all the way through the fight. Even when I thought I had him hurt, he was still boxing strong. So I don't, I don't know what the future will bring, but I mean, I'll continue to fight all comers. Anyone who they, who they match for me to fight, I'll box. <laughs> for six rounds, both parties have fought well, and it remains a very close battle here in round seven. Ezra Charles in black trunks is a classic boxer puncher able to handle any style opponent. But Pat Valentino in white trunks is a worthy adversary. Make a careless move and Pat can take you out with one shot to the jaw. Nine weeks ago, Ezra successfully defended his World Heavyweight Championship against Gus Lesnovic and is now springing right back into action. Charles won the heavyweight championship just four months ago when he beat Jersey Joe Walcott in an elimination bout. Caution has been set aside now as both men bomb with little thought to the fence. They both want to win big. Charles wants to prove he's a legitimate champion and Valentino is getting the biggest chance of his career. It's now or never for Pat. Maneuvers Valentino looking for an opening. Charles fires a beautiful straight right to Valentino's jaw. In slow motion, here's that perfect punch which has done the job so often for Charles. Valentino hits the deck and the referee rushes in to pick up the count. But it's all over for Valentino. He can't make it. wins a big victory in defense of his world heavyweight title as he KOs Pat Valentino. Tenth round of this 15 round. Leoma in the black trunks out of his corner. Charles pacing himself very well. He's ahead, definitely. The challenger has taken most of the punishment thus far, by far. 
As the Charles keeps hammering away at Lee Oma. Oma now being forced to hold on, and referee Ruby Goldstein separates the two. A ter terrific right hand. Oma sent back. Charles going after him with another terrific right. Lee Oma seems to be in trouble. Charles keeps right after him. As it Charles with wicked lefts and rights. Another left hand, and another, and another. Another wicked left, and another left. Oma goes reeling, and it looks as though referee Gu Ruby Goldstein has stopped the fight he has. Rex Lane, only 23 years of age, has been promised a shot at Walcott's title. If he can get by Charles tonight. Charles is really pouring it on now. And the dynamite effect of all those punches puts Lane down. The referee gets close to Lane to shut out the count. rush to get him ready for round 11. Rex Lane shook off the effects of that knockdown, and he's right back in the fight trying to make up lost ground. He wants to win big, but now Rex needs a knockout. Charles is matching every punch Rex throws with class of his own. Satterfield in dark trunks, his holder of one of the most startling knockout records of any fighter in the past 35 years. In 37 professional fights, Satterfield has scored 27 knockouts. And tonight, here in round one, it would appear he is too much for the former heavyweight champion, Ezra Charles. Charles, the experts will tell you, was an underrated fighter. For here was a man who had the power of a true champion, but somehow was never appreciated. Charles is a determined fighter. Satterfield, throwing caution to the wind, stays after his man. Charles demonstrates a degree of caution, as he knows Satterfield can put you away with either hand. It appears that Charles is looking for an opening. In this rugged battle, we go to round two. Satterfield, in his last four fights, has knockout wins over heavyweights Murray Bennett, Gene Brown, Bob Baker, and Ray Augustus. Charles, since losing his championship to Jersey Joe Walcott, has a knockout win over Rex Lane and Corley Wallace, and a decision over the very capable Joey Maxson. Here in this round, Charles carries the fight to Satterfield. Satterfield likes all the action he can get. Charles more sure of himself in this round. Moving into Charles gets hit with a terrific left hook, and Satterfield is down. The referee counts to ten as Satterfield is unable to get to his feet. The end comes with great suddenness as Ezra Charles knocks out the powerful Bob Satterfield. With this victory, Charles takes a big step up the ladder in his quest to regain the heavyweight title. This guy tells his buddy there's nothing he'd like. Ex-Marine Gene Tunney. Gene manages to keep a straight face as he goes through some serious muscle making. By 1924, the fighting leatherneck has swept through the light heavyweight division, beating such all-time greats as Battling Levinsky and Harry Greb. To make his dramatic appearance on the heavyweight scene, Gene signed to fight Georges Carpentier in 1924. The tenth round. Watch Gene Tunney on the right give a demonstration of his accurate punching.
Lafontaine is getting a more severe pummeling than Jack Dempsey gave him three years earlier. But the Frenchman refuses to go down under the barrage. George not only survives the 10th round, but he is still on his feet in the 14th. George backs Tunney toward the near ropes. Gene lashes out with a paralyzing body blow. The Frenchman sinks to the canvas as the bell rings. Round 15, but Carpentier cannot continue. Gene Tunney resolutely moves ahead to earn his chance at the title. In this newsreel shot, Gene, in the middle, is doing road work, part of his intensive training for his upcoming fight with brilliant boxer Tommy Gibbons, only man in six years to last the limit with champion Jack Dempsey. Tunney on the left, boxing magnificently, is far ahead on points. Watch Gene's accurate jab flick out, disrupting what is left of Tommy Gibbons' fight plan. Gibbons is backing, trying to last. Tunney lands a perfectly timed right, and Gibbons is down. The referee screams out the count. Tommy is up, but Gene immediately floors him again. It's all over. Tommy Gibbons is knocked out for the first time in his brilliant 14-year career. Over 100,000 fans. A live crowd greater than any attendance at any baseball game watches as the first round of one of boxing's most controversial fights begins. Tunney is wearing the light-colored trunks. The fifth and final million-dollar gate under the promotional reigns of Tex Rickard. This fight sets the record that may never be broken. $2,650,000 official gross receipts from a live gate. Champion Gene Tunney will receive a cool $1 million for 40 minutes' work. The fight itself follows a pattern similar to the first match. That is, until the fateful seventh round. Dempsey lands a potent right-hand counter, follows up with a series of seven devastating punches. Tunney goes down for the first time in his career. Dempsey stays near the fallen fighter, but referee Dave Barry points for Jack to move to a neutral corner. Only then does he begin the count. Is Tunney dazed, or is he wisely taking full advantage of these precious extra seconds? Tunney is up at the referee's count of nine. round, Tunney has fully recovered. In slow motion, watch him get in with a right that drops Dempsey for a one count. Notice here the referee incorrectly will start his count immediately after Jack's knee touches and before Gene could get to a neutral corner. Round 10. Tunney has taken complete charge. Bruised and exhausted, Jack Dempsey seems at the verge of being knocked out for the first time in 10 years. There's the bell. The fight is over. Gene Tunney overwhelmingly the winner. But the long count gives sporting buffs something to discuss whenever they get together. The Revolution Massage. AT&T. Why are there so many microphones? Here's an interesting close-up of Joe, a very determined-looking gentleman, as he bat that bag around. Challenger Jersey Joe Wolcott in white. The two fighters exchange punches. Lewis goes down from a crisp right to the jaw. That's the first time Joe has been dropped since Buddy Bear turned the trick 
six years ago. Rounds two and three were scored evenly. Here in round four, Lewis is still looking for an opening. There's that right-hand bomb by Walcott again. Lewis is taking a nine count. Joe is up, but no one envisioned that Walcott could do this to Joe Lewis. For 15 frustrating rounds, Lewis has pursued the clever Walcott all over the ring. The fight's over, and Lewis starts to leave the ring, thinking he has lost the decision and the championship. Nevertheless, Joe Lewis is awarded a controversial split decision and retains the title. Walcott and his handlers are utterly dismayed. This was the third contest between these two men, and although Charles won both times, each fight was a very close decision. Charles promised that he would be a very active champion when he beat Walcott to fill the spot vacated by Joe Lewis. This is his ninth defense in two years, a pace that makes him one of the busiest champions ever. Jersey Joe Walcott has been on the fringe of the title scene for four years now, starting with a split decision loss to Joe Lewis back in 1947. Now keep an eye on Walcott's left. Charles collapses like a sack of grain after that incredibly well-timed punch explodes on his jaw. The champion struggles to rise. He's on his feet, but he stumbles backwards from the continuing effects of that devastating punch. Walcott comes in almost nonchalantly. Now here comes that left hook. That punch twisted Charles' head almost completely around. Look at his distorted features. Charles crumbles to the canvas. Pandemonium in the ring after this incredible sudden ending. Walcott's handlers are ecstatic as Jersey Joe is the new heavyweight champion. As a Charles is helped to his feet, still under the effects of that smashing knockout punch. 318 contract and was paid $4,700 for his two day services. That made him the first motion picture actor ever to perform under contract. This is also the first film ever to make money. It grossed over $30,000. Edison found that nothing convinces skeptics like cash. Motion pictures had arrived as a legitimate and profitable entertainment form. Watch Peter miss with this murderously intended punch. You can't fault Courtney's enthusiasm or Corbett's wardrobe. Corbett Fitzsimmons fight, the first heavyweight championship contest ever filmed. That's Corbett on the right, and the balding Fitzsimmons on the left. Most men are able to wear their bathrobes only while shaving. Gentleman Jim and Ruby Robert get double use from theirs. Gentleman Jim stands ready and seemingly impatient for round one to get underway. The bell rings, and the scheduled 25 round bout begins. In the foreground, in the derby, is the timekeeper for the fight, Bat Masterson. The old frontier gunfighter had become a fixture in the fight scene because of his undisputed effectiveness in collecting guns and knives from the spectators. Fourteenth round. Corbett, with his back to the camera, is well ahead on points, and Fitzsimmons' nose is bleeding badly. But amazingly, the challenger is starting to press the fight. At this point, the old nitrate film starts to disintegrate. But a somewhat viewable version of the 14th round knockout was assembled from potato chip-like fragments. Watch Fitzsimmons on the right step under Corbett's left jab and land his own hard left to the champion's midsection. Gentleman Jim collapses. Corbett has evidently had the wind knocked out of him. 
He's still down when the referee completes the 10 count, and Fitzsimmons raises his hand in triumph. Reading the heavyweight champions of the world since James J. Jeffries' time, I must say Jeffries was the best. Then comes Jack Johnson, the world's greatest defensive fighter, who won the title from me. Bob Fitzsimmons is next. Then Jack Dempsey, that millionaire fighter, or million dollar fighter, rather. James J. Corbett, Gene Tunney, Philadelphia Jack O'Brien, who beat Bob Fitzsimmons after Jeffries had retired, and then Jess Willard. As to myself, you may rate me where you like. How would you rate Tommy Burns? Well, I don't know. I guess in today's uh, era of big heavyweights, and Tommy being as small as he was, I would have to rate him as a good, tough, he'd be a good, tough trial horse today. I don't think he could possibly win the world title in today's era. Well, of course, he couldn't look ahead to a man like Muhammad Ali. I hear a lot of talk about old-time great fighters. I hear people say that Joe Lewis, Jack Dempsey, Jack Johnson, Jim Jeffries, and all of them would have annihilated the likes of myself, Muhammad Ali. After watching these films, watching their opponents, watching their styles, watching how they fought, watching the footwork and the speed, and my critics will admit that I am the fastest heavyweight in the history of boxing with feet and hands. It may come as a shock to you, but I say that I would have beat every heavyweight that ever lived. World heavyweight champion Sonny Liston makes the second defense of his title against young Cassius Clay. Champion Liston in the trunks with the black stripe. Clay has the red stripe on his trunks. It's all even here in round three. Liston won the world heavyweight title two years ago when he KO'd Floyd Patterson in the first round. The champion is 32 years old, 10 years older than the challenger Cassius Clay. Cassius Clay throws a combination of blistering punches that back Sonny into the ropes. Clay has lightning speed, and although he's a 7-1 to underdog, has shown himself to be fearless. He opens up again. In round five, Clay continued to land accurate punches to the head and body while managing to keep out of trouble himself. Here in round six, he's definitely ahead in the scoring. As an amateur, Clay had a brilliant record. Cashes won the 1960 AAU and Olympic light heavyweight title, and the same year won the National Golden Glove heavyweight title. This is Clay's first fight this year. In his last fight, eight months ago, Cash has scored a convincing fifth round knockout over European heavyweight king Henry Cooper. Since winning the world title two years ago, Sonny Liston has defended it once in a rematch with Floyd Patterson. Sonny KO'd the former champ in the first round to prove his earlier victory was no fluke. Champion Sonny Liston has taken tremendous punishment here tonight, but he still hangs in there. Sonny Liston, unable to answer the bell for the seventh round. Cassius Clay is awarded a seventh round knockout and becomes a new heavyweight champion of the world. Century, 8 p.m. Friday on ESPN Classic. Ali still scoring with long left jabs here in round two. Cleveland, Big Cat Williams is pressing the action, but he can't seem to get set against the younger champion. Cleveland at 33 is giving way nine years to Ali. Ali looking for an opening. A quick one, two sends Williams to the canvas. The referee sends Ali to a neutral corner. Williams up with a count of three, but takes the mandatory eight count. Ali moves in and rains punches from all angles on the challenger. Lightning combinations here, and Williams goes down again. Williams gets up and takes another eight count.
Now watch as Williams misses with a brutal left hook. Ellie swarms all over Williams. And Cleveland is down again for the third time in the round. Williams is hurt. There's the bell saving Cleveland from a knockout. Williams looked like he wasn't going to beat that count. Heavyweight champion Muhammad Ali in white trunks comes out for round three looking for that one big knockout punch. The Ali shuffle again and a deadly combination of punches. Ali in complete charge here in round three. A dynamite right and Williams crumbles to the canvas. Williams takes the mandatory eight count. Williams definitely in trouble here in round three. Ali all over Cleveland Williams here in the third round in Houston's Astrodome. The referee is looking closely at the challenger. Williams has absorbed tremendous punishment. Taking Zora Foley too lightly. Why would you say that? Because every indication has been that you're confident that you can beat Zora. I'm confident I can whip all of them. This ain't nothing new. My image has been confident. What you're trying to make it look like something new for? I'm always confident I can whip all of them. You're being extremely truculent. Whatever truculent means, if that's good, I'm that. <laughs> <laughs> it's round four, Madison Square Garden. Muhammad Ali in white, slightly ahead in the story. Zora Foley in the dark trunk. Blistering combination and Foley goes down. Muhammad Ali raises his arms. The referee signals Ali to go to a neutral corner. Foley looks to his corner and is up at the count of eight. Ali is out to finish it here in round four. Surprisingly, Foley is coming right back strong. being very careful in there. Ali took both rounds five and six. Here in the seventh, the champion is way ahead in the scoring. It looks like Ali could end it any time he chooses. Boxing confidently, piling up the point. How great was he, in your opinion? He was the greatest personality in the history of sports, let alone the heavyweight yeah, division. I'll go with that. The greatest personality in the history of sports. Funny thing about him, he wasn't a great boxer, as 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 in the case of maybe Billy Kahn or Gene Tunney or maybe even uh, Jack Johnson. But he was, and he wasn't a great puncher. He couldn't punch in the same ball in the same league as uh, Joe Lewis. 
but he had the greatest leg speed of, and hand speed of any heavyweight I ever saw. Plus, he was a great competitor, had a good chin, put it all together, and in a heavyweight division, that spelled greatness, and that's what made him great. All right, we're down to magic time now, the time for Teddy Brenner, the president of boxing at Madison Square Garden, who's promoted more championship fights than any man in the history of the ring, to pick the greatest heavyweight boxing champion of all time. First of all, I'm going to pick Joe Lewis. That's my pick, but you're much more qualified than I am. Who do you pick as the greatest heavyweight champ? You're much more qualified. I agree with you. Joe you, Lewis. You pick Joe Lewis, yes, too? Yes. Why? Do. Because Lewis, in order to be a great heavyweight, you have to have a great punch. Lewis was the best puncher I've ever seen in the heavyweight division. He was a great boxer. He didn't have great leg speed, but leg speed is the one thing you don't, not, you don't need in the heavyweight division. I think he was the greatest. That's our pick. Joe Lewis is the greatest heavyweight champ of all time. Hope you've enjoyed it. Kurt Gowdy, on behalf of Teddy Brenner, bidding you all goodbye.